Hello everyone, I am absolutely so glad that you're joining me here today from Phoenix, Tennessee, uh, Phoenix Arizona as we look, go join Restoration Bible Fellowship and we talk to you and your family about your key to spiritual victory and I'm so excited that you're with me today. Uh, we'll be in Psalm 149 if you want to grab your Bible or maybe pull it up on your phone. But I'm really excited and glad that you're with us here today. We always want to start off in prayer. I want to welcome all of you who are thinking about or partly part of now the Remnant uh, Network, <clears throat> the Remnant Revival Network that I'm trying to kind of get started so that we can uh, really get the word out. Uh, also, don't forget to pray for all those pastors that we work with, Billy Parker and Eton, Georgia, Isaac and Shane. Uh, they're in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, Zach Sloan, up there in China Grove, uh, Bishop R. E. Lee with DCF Deliver Churches Fellowship International, of which I am the General Secretary and Christian Education Director, and also uh, uh, the churches out here in Phoenix that we're trying to connect with and get all of them inv involved in this last days in times revival. As always, if you have any prayer requests and you want us to pray live for you right now, put them in the comments and we'll pray as they, they come through. I am believing for every one of you that have a, a need in your life that God has your miracle. He's just waiting on you to come claim it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your love and mercy today. We thank you that you love us. You know us by our name. You've named all the stars and you still know our names. And Lord, we are so grateful and appreciative of that. Father, I pray for all of those pastors who are preaching this morning the unadulterated, pure word of God to their congregations, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to just move on them in such a powerful way that they will know and feel your hand on them. I pray for all those who are watching today, Lord, that may have a physical or a financial or spiritual need. I join my faith with them right now, and I'm believing that whatever they're needing, that they're going to receive it today. They're going to receive from the, from the very throne room of heaven the help that they need right now. And Father, for what we know you're going to do, we're going to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to get started with a, a really a, a, a song that fits. I've had it going through my head most of the morning. It's called, We've Got the Power. Let's agree together that all of our enemies will crumble at our feet. Whatever we find on earth shall be found in heaven. At the name of Jesus, Satan has to flee. We've got the power. Of Jesus, we've got all the power in the name of the Lord. No Satan raging, we cannot be defeated. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. For many years now, Satan's tried to stop us by the church of Jesus. It's still alive, like a mighty army. We keep marching onward, win every battle with the Lord by our side. And we've got the power in the name of Jesus. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. Oh, Satan rages. We cannot be defeated. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. We've got the power in the name of Jesus. Oh, we've got the power in the 
the name of the Lord. Though Satan rages, we cannot be defeated. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. Though Satan rages, we cannot be defeated. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. And truly this morning, if you're a child of the living God, you've got the power through Jesus Christ to walk in victory. And I hope that excites you this morning. If you have your Bible there nearby, would you please go to Psalm 149. It's the psalm right before the end of the book of Psalms. And he starts off with, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments to the, on the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. The, this honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Now this psalm you see is bookended by praise the Lord. Praise. So we should always start and end everything with praise and worship to God. What I want to bring into focus that many of you today, many, all of the church, all of Christendom, if we'll be completely honest, is in the midst of spiritual warfare. And because of that, many, many, Jesus would say that many in the last days, the love of many would wax cold. And we're seeing that. But what we are seeing is an all-out attack on the men and women and the children of God. And I want to help you today to get your keys to spiritual victory so that you and your family can stand firm in these last and evil days. First, we start off with we need to praise God with a new song. You gotta sing. You say, well, Brother Eric, I'm not a singer. I didn't say you had to go, go to recording studio and lay down tracks and make an album. I didn't say you need to go join the choir. What I said was, you need to sing. A song comes from a place from deep inside. About midnight, we read when Paul and Silas were in stocks. And at midnight, they were praying and singing praises. What happened? A little jailhouse rock. But we are told to sing a new song. Now, a new song comes when you experience God in your life in a way you haven't previously experienced him. You walk out of your valley, you walk out of your, your situation, and you begin to praise him because he brought you through. He helped you come out of whatever it was you were involved in. Psalm 40 and verse 3 says, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Notice what the psalmist says here. He's going to put a song in my mouth that's going to be such a, a song of praise, a song of glory to God, that many are going to hear it, they're going to see it, and they're going to fear God. And they're going to put their trust in Him. Do you know that people watch when you're going through a valley? If you're singing in the midst of a storm, if you're singing like Job, in the midst of it all, I'll praise Him. People watch. And what scares the enemy more than anything else is a Christian who can sing in the midnight hour. Psalm 98 and verse 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Why? For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy, heart, his holy arm have worked salvation for him. 
while we singing? Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. If he's blessed you, if he's healed you, if he's brought you through. You say, well, brother, every day is not sunshine and roses. Well, there may be a thorn now and then, as uh, George Amon Webster wrote in his song. But instead, what we do, we say, I'll keep praising him instead. We say, well, brother, why, why all the big emphasis on a new song? Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood your ra you ransomed people for God and every tribe and every language and the people and nation. In heaven, they've always sang, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, and they've sung that. But at the moment the Lamb comes to break the seals, a new song is sung because they're seeing something new. Worthy is the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 3, and they were singing a new song. Whoa, here's another new song. Before the throne, before the four living creatures, and before the elders, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They had experienced the, the, the keeping and transforming power of God in a way during the great tribulation that nobody else had ever experienced it, and they had a new song. Now, the... The Antichrist, during the same time, wants a song sung to him. Who can make war with the beast? Revelation 15. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. When you begin to experience God in a real, meaningful way, it triggers a song. You can't help it. It just bubbles up. But yet, which brings us to my next point, as we prepare for spiritual warfare, we've got to get worship from not being an event, but a lifestyle. In verse number 5, he says, We sing in our beds. What does that mean? What it means is that you just don't do it at a one-time thing where I'm just going to sing when it's daylight or I'll, I'll sing first thing in the morning. I'll sing. All day long, you got a song. You say, well, Brother Eric, you just don't know how it is at work. True. But then again, I know how it is at my work. And I'll still sing, Great is the Lord. I'll still sing, it may not, I may not be singing it out loud. It may just be playing in my head. Whatever song that I'm, I'm wanting to worship and praise God. Worship is not an event. It is a lifestyle. We have so many that they only sing at church. Well, they only read their Bible at church too, but that's another issue. But we focus on that one hour we give on, that we give God on Sundays because, hey, look God, I showed up, I, I checked the box. Rather than, I'm going to praise God at all times. He says, with the high praises of God in our mouth and a two-edged sword in our hand. What is our sword? I'm not talking about you go to the knife store, knife store and buy a real sword and go walking down, uh, walking through Walmart or Sam's or Costco going, ha, ha, ha. Hebrews 4 and 12 tells us that the Word of God is a living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. I was listening to a speaker this morning who said that in his mind, there were three sins that took place in the Garden of Eden, not just the one. Adam had been told to tend the garden. But yet, the enemy was allowed to get in. Sin number one. Sin number two was when Satan questioned the word of God, they didn't shut him down. 
which led to disobedience to the commands of God. So often in our lives, what we allow in will then have us question, well, did God really say? That's why Ephesians ties together in Ephesians 6 and 17, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because what goes on up here will begin to infect or and affect everything else that is going on in your life. We are never told to meditate on the promises of God. No, no. We are told to meditate on the commands of God. As God's word and what he's told us to do and to be kingdom minded begins to get into our spirit, it changes us from the inside out. Revelation 1 and 16 says this, In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shining, was like the sun shining in full strength. When John saw Jesus, he was speaking the word. Now, we've talked about this before, that there are three Greek words for word. There is graphia, which is written. What we write down. Okay? So, a lot of us have written things down. We might look at the written word of God, and we might have our, our Bible reading plan, but it, we're just reading. It's words on a page. But then it becomes, when you begin to pray and ask God to open scripture to you, it, be, it moves from that to logos, which is living and active. It begins to become part of your being. And as it becomes part of your being, when you meet certain situations in your life, it goes from logos to rhema because you're now in agreement with God's word. You say, well, Dr. Stansbury, can you, can you back that with scripture? So glad you asked. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is there, I mean, Luke chapter 3, when Jesus is in the, uh, in the midst of the uh, temptation in the wilderness, and Satan goes, hey, command these stones to be bread. Jesus comes back with, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Hey, okay, won't you jump off this ledge? Because the Bible says the angels will, give in, will be given charge lest you dash your foot across the stone. Now, that is in the book. But Jesus says, ah, but it's also written not to tempt the Lord your God. And then Satan takes him to another place and says, oh, I'll, you won't have to go to the cross. You won't have to do anything. I'll give you what's mine. And Jesus says, it is written. Man must worship God alone. Each time he took what was written as graphia, was in his spirit as logos, but when used in battle became rhema because he came into agreement with what God the Father has already decreed. I wish somebody hear me this morning. The reason sometimes that we don't get what we think we need to get is that we're not praying in agreement with what God has already established. We'll talk about where two or three are gathered in my name and come into agreement, and boy, uh, and as Pentecostals, we'll hang on that scripture. But who are you agreeing with? If you've got two people that are agreeing in, in contrariness to God's will and God's written command, it's not going to happen. But, if you've got two people coming into an agreement with what God has already said, what he has already bound, and what he's already loosed, I can promise you, you'll begin to see something happen. God told Elijah to pray for the rain to shut up. So he knew that when he prayed and said there will not be rain for three years, that he knew he was already in agreement with what God had decreed, and it came to pass just that way. Then, later, God says, now, go tell Ahab you're going to pray again, and we're going to bring rain. And in doing so, you know the story, the battle of Mount Carmel, when he destroyed, when they killed the prophets of Baal, he went and he prayed seven times. The last time, he goes, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand, and Elijah says, go tell Ahab we'll have the abundance of rain. Because Elijah prayed in conjunction and in agreement with God's written, revealed word. So how, what is our key here then to victory? One, let God fight. 
Can, I, can we just take a hallelujah minute there? We are so busy trying to solve our problems and figure out and scheme and I can do this and move over here, that, 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 that we don't stop for five minutes and go, wait a minute, what am I doing? I can't fight this battle. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. And he said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Now there's a prophet speaking. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde for the battle is not yours, but God's. He says, don't you worry about what your eyes are telling you, what your ears are telling you, what the enemy is saying. It's not your battle. It is a fixed fight. It's God's battle. 1 Samuel 17 and 47. David is facing Goliath. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Now you know the story. David says, hey look, Goliath, you come at me with sword and spear. You've been trained to war. You, you went to the, the Philistinian um, war college. You got it figured out. You a big man on campus. But I'm not coming at you with those weapons because they're ineffectual. I'm coming at you in the name of the armies of the Lord God of Israel. The difference being there for you and I is that it's not, we can't fight an enemy that's older than us, more powerful than us, that even some angels have to go get help to fight. What makes you and I think that we are capable or equal to that task because there are things we don't see and things we don't know? Proverbs tells us that the horse is made ready for the day of battle. We prepare, but victory ultimately belongs to the Lord. You and I have to get our hands out of the way and give it to Him. We cannot defeat the enemy on our own. We must depend on His sword, His word, coming to an agreement with Him. He says, whatever you, has been bound, whatever you bound, has already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose has already been loosed. In other words, God's in all the binding and the loosing already. He's waiting for us to come into agreement. And the moment we come into agreement with Him, victory. Victory is mine. Exodus 14. And Moses said to the people, now you know they're at the Red Sea, here come the Egyptians, blah, 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 blah. there's water in front of them, they're like, you brought us out here to die, and notice what Moses says. Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Can I just stop there for just a moment? He says, first of all, fear not. Many of you, many of all the country, the world, is living in fear of, and I'll let you fill in the blank, lest I be deplatformed on social media. They live in fear, and because of their fear, they no longer stand firm in anything. Moses said, fear not, stand firm, and see what God's going to do. The rest of the verse. For the Egyptians... Whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, Dr. Shansberry, you're telling us to praise God, but this scripture says be silent, because when God begins to fight, don't tell him what to do, don't try to guess how he's going to do it, let him work. The problem many of us run into, we try to help God along. Ask Sarah, Hagar, and Abraham. We try to, well, you know what, I want this, and so God, I'm going to move this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way. And then when things happen in a way we don't want them to happen, we're like, well, well God must have failed. Hmm. It's because of us. We become the, the blockage to our miracle. 
The second thing, keep praising God. First of all, can I just tell you, praise God for who He is. Not for what He's done, necessarily, but that He's God. When, as you go through Ephesians, and that, this is not in my notes, if I go grab my, my personal journal. And you go through Ephesians chapter 1, there are six things that in the verses 1 through 8, he talks about we have in Christ. We're chosen, we're adopted, we're favored, we're redeemed, we're forgiven, and we're blessed. You say, well, that's what he's already given us. That right there should be enough. And as an adopted child, I understand what it means to be chosen and adopted. See, oh, and I have nothing against you natural born children. Mom and dad got what they got. You know, how you look, all that stuff. They got what they got. My parents got to go and look at babies and pick the one, like a cabbage patch kid, that they wanted. And then he went before a judge and said, he is now my son. And the judge changed my name and legally gave me access to everything my father has. Now, can I apply that spiritually? When I was born here, I had a name, and I was born under the kingdom of Satan. Darkness. But one day, my father called and said, I pick him. And he adopted me, changed my name, and gave me access to everything my father owns. If he does nothing else, that's enough to praise him. The second thing we should be praising God for is His character, which is never changing. He loves you with an unchanging love. And can I just be real for a minute? Come closer. If you don't know Him as Lord and Savior of your life, if you've never experienced the new birth of adoption through Jesus Christ, let today be the day you get a new song. You say, well, Brother Eric, how does that happen? One, you are commanded to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is, is the Lord of all, rose from the dead, the only begotten Son of the Father, and you are commanded, see the commandments, huh? To confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now we know this, that every tongue will at some point in time in history say that Jesus Christ is Lord, but you're given the grand opportunity to do it now unto salvation because if you die lost in your sin when you stand before the the great white throne you will bow and say jesus christ is lord but now it is a statement of fact not a statement of salvation let's pray father god i thank you for this word today i thank you god that you hear us when we pray and i ask father god in the name of your son jesus christ that today these words will go to somebody and be a blessing, will be an encouragement, and that someone will hear these words and hear your voice saying, come home, and will find you before it's everlasting too late. And for what we know you're going to do through your word, using this, broad, this humble little broadcast, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor forever and forever. In Jesus' name we pray, in Yeshua's name. Amen. I'm glad that you joined me today. If you join me here live on Facebook, you know, please make a comment. If not, go to, uh, go to my YouTube channel, like and subscribe so when I post new things, uh, you can be aware of it and be a part of it. If you're interested in joining the Remnant Revival Network, uh, please email me at pastorsansbury at gmail.com. It's a work very much in progress, so it's not anything big and it is not a denomination. It is simply a group of people trying to pray together, staying in the loop together, so that we can bring, bring forth a remnant revival before Jesus Christ comes back. Email me with any of your prayer requests, questions, comments, or concerns, but you're always welcome. If you're looking for the audio version of this, go to uh, uh, your favorite podcasting format and just look up Eric Sansbury Ministries, Walking in the Word, and it'll be there. So until next week, 
This is Dr. Eric Sandsbury, Senior Pastor of this little online Restoration Bible Fellowship, part of the Remnant Revival Network and Delivered Churches Fellowship International. We thank you so much for coming with us. May God's grace and peace be multiplied to you and yours. We'll see you next week. Have a great week.